Wait for it. Welcome back to my shop. All right, I'm at the point now where I've got all of the kind of rough shaping already done. I'm done with all my rasp work and I've started sanding the sides. Because these are cherry, I really want to get these down to a fairly high grit because I, uh, I really think cherry looks nice with just a coat of oil on a really finely sanded surface. The next thing I really need to do before I can glue this up is make sure that my transitions of the maple steps into the cherry sides work nicely. So I've kind of roughed this out on the table saw and I've done some rough sanding, but I still have a little bit of a rough edge here. I also have to start thinking about how I'm going to handle the wedges on those through tenons, and that's what I'm going to focus on here. I really like using a drafting pencil for when I do have to mark with a pencil instead of a knife. Um, on this grain, it, I think it's going to be tricky for me to get a, a knife line in there, and it's probably going to be even harder to see that knife line. So I am going to use lead, and I like using a drafting pencil for this. For one, I can really get that tip nice and sharp, and they're also they're pretty durable. The lead that goes in these things doesn't wear down as quickly as a standard pencil. So I'm just going to take that and run my lead line right along here and I'm going to basically just sand down as close as I can get to that line knowing that the entire pencil line itself can get removed but just to the very edge of it. The last thing I want to do is go too far because then I'll have to start sanding the cherry down to meet the maple. That's not something I want to get involved with. You can just barely see my pencil line. So basically all I'm doing on this side is removing that pencil line and I'm good. I'm going to leave this, I'll probably leave just a little hair of that pencil line again because I, I want to err on the side of leaving this a little bit proud because it's not going to be that big a deal to do some kind of final sanding on maybe, you know, 150 or 220. Um, what I really want to avoid though is having to hit the that intersecting joint with 80 grit with the uh, random orbit sander after I assemble this thing. I've gone ahead now and dry assembled the piece again and I'm really close on the ends of those steps and how they transition into the sides. And I want to focus in on a little bit of a design element here. It's probably a little bit hard to tell on the camera, but one of the things I did on this top step is that I sanded more heavily in the middle here and also did the same on this uh, kind of eased edge on the top and the bottom. And it gives it a little bit of a slightly gently curved profile. And I didn't quite do that as much on the bottom step, and I really like how that looks because I think it really works well with the curves on the side. So I'm going to go ahead and basically shape a little bit of a curve into the front of this step and probably clean this one up a little bit more too so that you have you know, a noticeable but subtle curve to the front of that profile. Now that I have my gentle curve profiled on the front of the step, the last thing I need to do is cut the kerfs that are going to receive the wedges in these through tenons. So I've got my combo square set to an eighth of an inch and I'm actually going to use my marking knife for this process because I'm going to try to make this saw kerf as clean as possible. Then I'm just going to extend my line, this time just with pencil, all the way down as a reference point for when I make the cut. Now, it might seem like overkill, but I'm going to use my tenon saw for this operation, largely because it's going to have a thicker kerf and it is also a rip saw. If I were to use my dovetail saw, it would work just as well, but it wouldn't leave nearly as wide a kerf, and I'd have to use a much thinner wedge. I 
I've gone ahead and cut a set of wedges now. Basically just took a strip of wood and ripped it down to the exact same width as the tenons. And then I put a straight edge along it and just traced an angle and then cut it out on my bandsaw and I just cleaned it up with a little sandpaper. Now the reason I left these wedges as long as I did is I want to fine tune exactly where I source my final wedge from this strip. So if I just insert it into the kerf that I already cut and see where it stops, that's basically the point that I want my, to be my bottom for my wedge. So I'll just make a mark there and then I know that's the bottom of my wedge and then of course I can leave the end long because I'll be trimming that after I glue up. And there's my final wedge. Unfortunately, this is the part of the project where I have no alternative but to sand by hand. All of these concave surfaces, there's no way I can really get a power sander in there because the edges of the pads on the power sander would catch on these concave surfaces and leave marks. So my safest and best option is really just to roll up my sleeves, put on my respirator and sand by hand. All right, well now it's uh, time for the moment of truth when I can actually glue this thing up. And really, this is a really straightforward glue up. All I'm gonna do is put a good amount of glue on each tenon and then get a little glue on the insides of the mortises and everything should just slide together and I can clamp it down and drive in my wedges. I've got the clamps off now and I'm back at the bench. And all I need to do at this point is take my flush cut saw and remove the excess of the wedges. And since they're so small, it's a fairly quick process. And with the wedges removed, then I just need to flush up the uh, proud tenons here. And I'm just gonna do that with my block plane with the stool turned on its side. Well this is probably one of the more labor intensive sanding sessions I've had to do. Because of all these contours I really couldn't use any power sanding tools to do this job. So I had to do the entire thing by hand. Starting at 80 grit and going all the way up to a thousand grit. 
Now, because I went up to such a high grit, and this is a pair of closed grain materials in the cherry and the hard maple, I'm going to go and use my traditional heated oil mixture, and that will make sure that it will penetrate the wood despite the fact that I've sanded up to a thousand grit. So after all of that work, I'm really looking forward to seeing how this cherry looks once I get a coat of oil on it. Here you can see a view with the first coat of boiled linseed oil applied. I'm probably going to apply four, maybe even five coats of boiled linseed oil over the course of this finish schedule. And I still haven't made up my mind what I'm going to do for a top coat, if any, on this piece. I would like to have something at least more durable than just boiled linseed oil on the tops of the steps, because that's where you'll actually get a little bit of wear and tear. At the same time, I really would like to keep the sides with as minimal of a thick film finish if I can avoid it. So that'll be the last thing I have to figure out. But I'm really happy with how the grain of the cherry works together. And the maple and the cherry is a nice contrast as well. So it really highlights both materials in this piece. <laughs> 